Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Gareth Soloway, who is the Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com and VerifiedInvestingCrypto.com. Gareth, great to have you back on. Hey, such a wonderful thing to be back with you and to talk markets. Well, Gareth, you're the man to talk to. You've made some uh, very accurate calls. Uh, you know, we're in a bear market right now, and I want to get your take on what is coming next. But before we get into Bitcoin and crypto and stocks, I wonder if you could set the table and tell us about what you're seeing with the Fed and what they're doing with raising rates, recession, inflation, and all those things. Yeah. So, so I mean, per the last Federal Reserve meeting a, a few weeks ago, we basically had a little bit more of a dovish Federal Reserve tone, right? So they raised the 75 basis points, which is what the market expected. But in the conference, it was a little bit more dovish. That created this massive move up in the tech sector. We saw stocks and the S&P just rip higher, right? Now, interestingly enough, we got the jobs to report this morning, right? So the non-farm payrolls came out. It came out over 500,000 new jobs. And that kind of made the markets freak out a little bit because I think the markets had thought the Federal Reserve was almost done raising raising, if not done, and expected a weaker jobs report to kind of confirm that they were on the sidelines. With this better than expected jobs report, I think it puts September in play for at least 25 basis points, maybe 50 basis points. And that has the market, again, a little bit uneasy that the Fed is just going to keep tightening monetary supply. Now, for me personally, I think that the jobs numbers are lagging. So I think that, again, you're going to see more and more weakness coming in the coming months. So maybe the Fed raises in September a little bit, but I really do believe that's it. I think that'll be all that there will be um, because I do think we'll be in a, 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 a you know a defined recession. I mean, in, even now with the GDP numbers, you could say, yeah, we're in a recession, but the jobs numbers kind of go against that. But I do think by end of year, there's no doubt about whether or not it's a recession. Yeah, and you said that um, you you see one more rate hike maybe coming in September, and then the Fed maybe uh, halts there, and and then they start QE again, maybe. Yeah, so I, I think definitely they're halting after September, at, at, if for no other reason than the midterm elections, right? So the Fed never wants to be viewed as influencing the the elections, and and it's not that rate hikes would do that. It's it's more that if the rate hike causes a massive market sell-off or a market rally, then that could be looked at as influencing. So I think September again, 25, 50 basis points, but then I think they stop for the elections. And then I think by the time the elections are over in November, December, the economy is far too weak to raise anymore. Now, let's be clear. I don't think the Fed's going to come out and start lowering rates and printing money again in the near future because inflation is still going to remain elevated, right? So, you know, yes, it's going to come down. We could see the price of oil. We could see the price of gasoline. All of those are cratering. That's going to help bring inflation down, but it's not going to take it back to like 2% or sub 2%. So what that's going to do is it's going to basically put handcuffs on the Fed where when we enter a recession, they're not going to be able to just print us out right away. Now, I do think a year from now, we could be in such a bad recession with, with let's say, inflation at 4%. And if, we're, if we have unemployment, let's say, at 8% or 10%, then yes, that's the lesser of the two evils. And that would be to print money again and try to get us out of that. So, so it's a tricky road here. The market is not understanding that the Fed has its hands tied yet. And I think that's going to be the next shoe to drop later this year, like November, December, when the markets are like, oh, look, we're in a recession. Fed, please come save us. And the Fed's going to say, guys, inflation's at 4 or 5% still. We can't print money and save the day. And then you see the next big market flush. Very interesting. So with, with that said, um, how do you see Bitcoin and the stock market playing out? Could we have some relief rallies happening, but yet we're still in a downward trend? Yeah. So, and that I think that to some extent is what we're having now. Let me show my screen real quick here so we can take a look. But basically, what you've had is ever since we pierced that initial pierce of the 2017 highs here, 
We've seen Bitcoin kind of go up a little bit, come down, up, down, and basically going sideways to slightly higher. So I'm inclined to think that in the near term, we continue to see that price action. I kind of expect one more move up here, maybe in the Bitcoin chart, hitting 25,500. There's a small chance we could get up to resistance at 28 and change. But ultimately, I think that later this year, when that shoe drops that the Fed can't save the day and it causes a big risk reduction, right? You, you have a risk off environment. We know that Bitcoin goes down in a risk off environment. Once the stock market investors realize that, it, it's going to filter through to crypto. And I do think there's still one more leg lower before we finally get a bottom. And I'm still pricing in really a target price of around thirteen dollars to $12,000 on that next flush. Got it. That makes sense. So you're saying this re relief rally that's happening right now, we could hit about 25, between 25 to 30, and then we go down to new lower lows. Yeah, that's exactly what I, I think right now. And again, you know, the easy way for us to tell is to look at this channel, right? So see this upsloping the bottom line, that's kind of keeping price in check. As long as price stays in here, I think you favor neutral to upside, maybe here or here. But if you break this line, this is a def definitive trend line connecting all these lows. That's where I think you start to flush. You'll probably get a small bounce at the previous 2017 high and then eventually break through that. So, so I think, again, yeah, short term, neutral to positive on Bitcoin from here. And then again, later this year, you got to expect one more flush out. And it, it probably will be the nastiest and the worst in terms of fear because always the end of cycles are the scariest, right? Where things, you know, you see, imagine seeing Bitcoin at 12 or 10,000. Everyone's going to start to doubt, like, will Bitcoin survive? Can it survive? That's when you actually, as an investor, need to start thinking about really buying into it. Yeah, absolutely. When there's blood on the streets, right? That's right. That's um, exactly it. Do you think that sometimes there's narratives that flow with price movements, whether the price is going up or down? Do you foresee any there being any type of catalyst? Maybe another crypto company goes bankrupt or something economically happens, uh, a macro factor? Yeah, so I, I think the narrative right now is, and what's interesting for me is that you can see the the kind of the angle on Bitcoin has been very sideways to slightly up. It's not been vertical bouncing. And I think part of that, and, and what's interesting is if you look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ's really ripped up and those usually coincide. So a lot of people have been saying, well, why hasn't Bitcoin had a big move up like the NASDAQ instead of just going slightly up sideways? And I think the answer there is, is that, you know, with Celsius and Voyager and all these other ones, you have a lot of money that's just scared. Like, you know, who wants to put their money in with these brokers and be in? In crypto, when who knows what the next shoe to drop is, who which which broker is going to go under, which one's going to file for bankruptcy. So I think that's kind of keeping a lid on the upside price in Bitcoin as well. But I think later this year, that narrative is going to shift to that panic sell off. And I do think the final flush out will be something major. I don't know if it's Michael Saylor and MicroStrategies mm -hmm. finally throwing in the towel and dumping their Bitcoin at like 10,000. Uh, maybe we see a bigger broker go bankrupt. I mean, all these possibilities are there, but I do think more is going to happen before you get an ultimate bottom. Mm. And, you know, let's say uh, with the scenario you mentioned, Bitcoin goes on to the 12 to 13K range. How long do you think we stay there? I know that's a hard question to answer, but is it a few months and then we start you know, slowly, steadily moving our way up? Yeah, so if, if if past cycles are any indication, and I can show we can go to the 2017 cycle here. So what's interesting about the 2017 cycle is you kind of had this period where we had the big dump out and then you had this lots of chop for a while, which could be what we're doing right now. I'm not sure, but you know that would make sense if it were to go to like, October, November. And then you had this final flush out. And then notice how it took a while for it to kind of digest before finally starting to make that next move up. So again, if you look at this final flush, it kind of bottomed out in December of 2018. And then the next move up, you could arguably say kind of started in April. So my guess is you have about six months of chop around the lows where you have people that are saying, this is the worst. And then you have people that are nibbling, maybe smart money starting to buy down there. And you get that kind of exchange where, where neither side is winning. They're just exchanging shares from people that are fearful with people that are buyers and saying, okay, this is the right time to accumulate. So my guess is, yeah, you'll see usually bottoms, you'll see a lot of chop as, as the bottom is made. 
So it's safe to say you will be shorting. <laughs> well, <laughs> so so this is this is actually really interesting. And, and, and to be clear, like, you know, if, if there's one thing I know, it's that it's very hard and it's very hard for me to pick exact bottoms. Right. So so like when we were down at 19,000, you know, I basically announced that I was going to be buying my first huddle position out of a multiple. Right. And, and the idea there is that, you know, I basically in my head, I love Bitcoin long term. I'm such a big bull long term, even though it doesn't seem like that. I'm just a chart guy. So, I, you know, if it tells me it's going down, you know, I have to go with that. I can't, you know, make it make believe. So so basically in my head, I'm like, OK, I'm going to put X amount of money in Bitcoin as a huddle position at some point. And at 19,000, I put like one sixth of that to work. And the idea there is that basically I do believe it's going to go lower, but just in case it doesn't, I do want some skin in the game to participate on that upside. So basically one sixth in at 19, if it dropped another two to 3,000, I do another one sixth, another two to 3,000, another one sixth, basically dollar cost averaging all the way down to like 10,000. And then the way I look at it is like, even if it goes to 10,000, if my average price is 15,000, and it's going to 100 or 150 or 250, like at that point, it's a rounding error, you know? So again, I think investors need to really be aware that even the pros, it's almost impossible to pick the exact low. So why try? Just kind of generally say, okay, well, this is a, this is a good level if I have that long-term thesis. And then you just start to kind of dollar cost average in. Yeah, I usually think of it as a zone, an accumulation zone versus an exact number that I need to figure out because that's near impossible. Yeah, I call it. It's funny, yeah, because because I do the same thing. I call it the shotgun effect, where like if you're like a sharpshooter, you have to hit the exact target. But if you have a shotgun, like it sprays everywhere in that area, and it's like, listen, just as long as you get it in this area, you're good to go. Yeah, and you know, look, you brought up a great point, and folks sometimes go with their emotions or they see a big news like yesterday we heard about BlackRock. That does not mean we are going back into a bull market today, right? right. We're still in the bear market, still downward trend. You got to look at the charts and the technical analysis, which obviously that's what you use uh, as your gospel or source of truth. Yeah. Um, so with Bitcoin uh, potentially going down to those prices, all coins are going to suffer tremendously. Uh, are there any all coins that you're, focusing on maybe looking to short or you would look to accumulate if you know as things get uh, at lower valuations yeah so so i think like you know for me I, number one is is i think that ethereum is going to survive you know i think it's got enough built on it where it's going to survive the question is how low does it go and i think you know again in terms of the chart what's amazing about the chart is we have hit resistance here on ethereum you can see these pivot lows right here and then look at exactly where price went. It pulled back. Now it's trying to break through there. If it does break through there, maybe we get up to this 2000 level. Maybe off chance we get to this down sloping line, which connects all the recent highs. But the bottom line is, to me, this is just a, a, an interim rally before another leg lower. And the key is, where are we going to go? And, and my guess is you're looking at like $650 or so. I think that would coincide nicely with the 12 to 13,000 level on Bitcoin. So I do think, again, you have you have that potential downside. But but this is, again, one that I think will survive. So it's one that I'm very interested in kind of hodling at the right levels. I don't have any yet. I was actually going to buy my first one at like 830 right here. There was this little pivot point right here, and it just never got there. It never got there, so I didn't get filled. But But the bottom line is, as a trader, you learn very quickly that you'll miss a bunch of trades, and that that's okay because there's always more trades coming around the corner. Like a lot of the kind of the retail crowd is always like, oh my goodness, you know, I missed a trade. I got to chase it now. I'm just like, you know what? Missed a trade. It's just another one of the thousands that I've missed in my, my trading career. But you know what? I only have to catch this amount, this handful, and I'll make great money. And anytime I let that discipline slide and I chase I almost inevitably can guarantee that's my losing trade. And it's just like, damn it, why did I, you know, why did I chase it? Why did I break my rules? And so that's just kind of interesting. But I think, I think Ethereum is interesting. You know, if you look at some of these other ones, uh, Polkadot, for instance, uh, we can zoom in on Polkadot. Polkadot's trying to have a little bit of a bullish run here. It has to break this area, uh, $8.80. But if it breaks $8.80, I think you have a shot of going to maybe $10.80. So, I mean, I think there is some some near-term upside in some of these, 
before that leg down. It's just a matter of your time frame. Like not everyone can be a swing trader. If you're not a swing trader, just sit on the sidelines or, or dollar cost average in. Now the service that you provide, and and um, I'm curious, it, it, you do you provide like the signals and trades you're making, or do you like trade other folks? Uh, you know their 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 capital. Yeah, for crypto, at least I don't trade anyone else's capital. It's just, you know, I do it for myself um, and I just put out the signals. So verifiedinvestingcrypto.com, it's just purely, you know, basically when I see a level, when I see a signal that's a, a high probability trade signal, I'll put out the long or short at the exact price. I always, re I do my recommended portfolio percentage too, because I think that's really helpful to people. Like the, you know, people always are like, wait, are you doing everything? Are you doing like zero, per 1%? And so I do that as well to guide them. And then each day I do a video, which kind of we walk through all the technicals of the chart. So it's almost like an educational video every single day. So, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a cool little service there. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see people that, you know, you, you, I have people in the service now that they bought in at like 65,000 cause they got caught up in momentum and, mm -hmm. and now they're like, thank goodness I'm finding out that there's a different way to do it where it actually makes sense. And I can make money on these type of moves. And, and is there a particular exchange or platform you use for your longs and shorts? Um, so, so not, not in particular, I have, I have a, a bunch of different, different brokers. So, so this is the kicker, right? Even before we started seeing some of these brokers having issues and not allowing withdrawals, I was always one where, where I come from a stock world where your investment account is FDIC insured. And I'm very aware that crypto accounts aren't like that. They're not insured by the government. And so I spread my money around through multiple brokers. And that way, if one has an issue, at least it's not all my money. Um, and, and I think that just mitigates. So, so it's interesting because as a trader, you always are looking for high percentage, low risk trades. And I think as a trader, once you get good at that, you kind of start to replicate that in your daily life, right? Where, you know, okay, well, how do I mitigate risk with a broker? Well, spread your money with three or four brokers, you know, doing things like that in life. And, and it, it works really, really well. Hmm. All right. Let's talk about stocks. Um, Obviously, crypto and, and stock, the stock market are highly correlated. They move uh, very much in the same pattern. Um, are there any specific stocks that you're looking at to short and, and you know, what's your outlook? Is it similar to what you mentioned with crypto? Yeah. So, so, you know, right now, I think the stock market is due for a pullback. Um, I'll show you this chart. And this is, this is, I like literally get giddy when I look at charts like this and anyone who doesn't believe in charts. I mean, this is just, this is just another great example of how amazing charts are. So this is the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100 chart. So this is basically all a hundred stocks, mostly like Apple, Google, Microsoft, all those stocks. And what you can see is it was trading inside of this range. And then look at how just over the last couple of days it came up and it pierced this upper line and it touched this, this pink line. And what the pink line is, is a connection of this high, which was basically going back to the all-time highs on the NASDAQ, and this line. And then look at today. Boom. Right away, it falls back there. The NASDAQ's down a little over 1% today. So so again, that was that's, that's just kind of I, I, over the last few days in my stock service, I was accumulating kind of shorts on the NASDAQ, anticipating this. And the charts were just guiding me. It's a beautiful thing to kind of free yourself from the emotion and just say, charts, you tell me what to do. I'm not going to tell you. So I like the Qs is a short here. I think Apple is a really, really interesting short. I'll show you this. Um, again, just going to charts. These two. So if you connect this high here, to this high and drop a perfectly parallel line down, you get this low and exactly that low. So mm -hmm. now you have a reason. And by the way, parallels are one of the most underestimated tactics in technical trading. And basically that told you this was going to have a bounce. But what's even more fascinating is that if you take that parallel line and you do a, this, the parallel line right here, which connects through this high right to here, through this low right here, all these lows along here, look at what Apple just hit on the chart. So for me, I look at that and I say, okay, you hit here, you snapped a, almost a straight line up. Apple's ridiculously overbought. Chances are, what are you going to get? You're going to get a pullback on Apple. And that's exactly what, what I'm looking for. So I like a short on Apple here as well. So again, it's, it's, it's very cool to just kind of, I mean, it gets me excited and giddy to kind of do these charts because you never know what you're going to discover. And then when you do, you're like, dude, I just basically printed money from just knowing a few trend lines. <laughs>
For sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. The way you, uh, that was drawn out shows <laughs> yeah. it's about to go down. Um, wow. Um, you know, as far as, uh, or I should say in summary, um, short where possible, because we are still in a downtrend, obviously follow the, the signals and they can, folks can follow your respective signals and look for, uh, once we're in that accumulation zone of the lows, uh, uh, certainly a buying opportunity and, and having yep. a, a long-term outlook, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially with crypto. Like I'm, I'm such a believer that eventually the Fed, even if it's a year from now or five years from now, eventually the Fed's going to go back to printing. It's what they do best. And, and where the economy is kind of addicted, kind of like a drug addict to that printing. So if, if they don't print at some point, you're going to see the economy really go into what I fear would be a depression even. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's where Bitcoin really starts to shine. And you'll see a point where you see this inversion where right now it goes down with risk assets. I believe that at some point in the future, it'll behave more like gold, where when there's fear, when there's issues, you'll see Bitcoin actually start to go up more. Uh, we're just a little bit away from that at this point because it's such a new asset. Remember, people forget it just started in 2009 versus right. the stock markets being around for such a long time, but it will get there. You just have to be patient. Now, Gareth, I, I know uh, investing in crypto and stocks is your thing, but do you follow bonds in the real estate market at all or is not your forte? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the beautiful thing about charts is that if you can chart it, you can you can, you can can dictate with high percentage chances of what's going to happen. So, like, the beauty thing about it is, is the, the real estate market, for instance, was just screaming a top. And, and you could almost tell, even without knowing charts, when you hear, and I heard about this too, people paying like 100000 over asking and like all this crazy stuff. It's just like, okay, that's that's a bubble. That's what people were doing with Bitcoin, willing to pay any price when it was at 68, 69,000. Same sort of mentality. And now we see real estate collapsing back down and coming back to earth. And in terms of the 10-year yield and, and bonds, the same thing, right? So I, I love how, how, and let me show my chart here on the 10-year yield. Um, there we go. So basically what you could see here is, is when we were at this top at like 3.5%, there was like panic that the yields were just going to go up. And mm -hmm. sure enough, it just topped out right there. And interestingly enough, I want to show you, I mean, just you guys know, I love my trend lines. We'll just put a trend line from 2013 through, through 2018 and just extend it out and look at what you hit. So even if you didn't know anything but a trend line, when you hit this, look at how it pulled back here. It pulled back here. Well, doesn't it make sense that at that line, you're going to get at least some sort of pullback? And that's exactly what we've gotten. So, so again, anything you can chart, remember the key is it needs to have some volume. So it has to have some, some participants. Like, you know, you can't chart a stock that trades a thousand shares a day. It just doesn't right. work. Same thing with a crypto if it trades like nothing a day. But if it trades with some volume, with some participants, the, the the psychology of investors is portrayed in this in the in the chart and therefore you can trade it the same exact way it's such a cool thing because you know if, if there's one thing I'll say to everyone out there listening is like get educated it is the it is the most powerful thing and I say to people like if if at retirement on the pace you're at you maybe may, let's say you have would have three hundred thousand for retirement everything you learn about investing that's in charts all of a sudden you learn two things you're at 400,000 in retirement five things 800,000 a hundred things you're at millions in potential retirement because at, especially at your age you it's like it's like you just have so much upside to put that to use it's really powerful and it's empowering so i do i do hope people get educated it's so important Oh yeah. And and I can speak from experience. I didn't know anything about money and, and so forth. And uh, it's it's only until I discovered crypto that I finally got financially educated because it forced me to learn a lot of things. And yes. then when I understood technical analysis and how market cycles work, it was like, wow, that's when I started making money. It's so true, man. It's so true. And so, so, you know, I think, I think we all, and, and remember people out there that have gotten slammed I was slammed. I think you were probably the same way. Like there's no one out there that walks into trading or investing and is like, I'm an instant genius. I'm just making ah. millions. Now, if it's a bull market, everyone thinks they're a genius, but yep. then the bear markets, that's where reality strikes. But the idea is that there were periods where I blew my account up multiple times and I had to start from scratch again. So don't get discouraged, but you just need to learn from the mistakes to figure out what you did wrong. Don't repeat them.
Absolutely. Gareth, always a wealth of information, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. 